Everyone, everyone can hear me in the back? It's fine? OK. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Hacking MFPs, a Postscript and we've been hacked talk. A few words about myself. Somebody of you might know me uh, as MFAC author or previous Hacking MFPs uh, presentations. Uh, <clears throat> and I would like to, just as a warm up, to ask the audience. Which vendor do you think will will be covering? So I'll ask to raise hands for Xerox. Okay, who is for HP? Oh, much bigger. It's like seventy percent. And Canon, like ten percent and five percent zero. Okay. Uh, and one more question is like, who? How many of you have written any by hand any PostScript file? Uh, not generated, but written by hand. OK, it's around 25%, cool. And uh, some PostScript file which interacts with hardware or any weird things, like, OK, two hands, three, OK. So this will be very interesting for you. OK, so a quick refresher. Uh, why, why, again, uh, I talk about MFPs and so on and so on? Well. MFPs, as you might know, printers and so on, are basically essential part of uh, any modern network. And as part of any modern network, it's like a trustworthy resource because it's inside the network. Uh, usually it carries confidential data, confidential documents being printed while, uh, once in a while or less confidential data. Uh, it's part of the private network of where it is being deployed. It is not very well patch managed, usually. Uh, well, it's because it's, kind, it's seen as an embedded device, and patch management is not very well standardized on those devices. And usually it is, or sometimes it is connected to the public internet, which is very bad. OK. so. The history of hacking MFPs goes back to the 60s, was uh, slightly over 50 uh, years old. It will be more, uh, more uh, comfortable with this story. It's like a story from 60s where uh, they spied on the US M uh, uh, Soviet Union embassy. Also, they had a camera, but it's more mechanical camera and so on, some circuitry. And basically, hacking MFPs goes back to the 60s. So, however, modern uh, hacking goes, uh, covers like the last 10 years, like the last decade, and it started around 2002, public modern print, uh, printer hacking research. And then it kept iterating every few years. Uh, and basically, we are now in 2011, 2012, with very revived printer hacking interest. Uh, and this particular talk, uh, compared to other talks I, I've made or other talks available, will mainly focus already on uh, remote code execution uh, on the MFP side. And basically, in 2010, we've demonstrated uh, and we've mapped uh, publicly exposed MFPs and printers. And as you can see, with little scripting, there was like We've gathered tens of thousands uh, of these. We've mapped them on the uh, Earth. So you can see a big density in Europe of various vendors. Uh, also, we've found ways and demonstrated how, uh, how it is possible to deliver generic uh, payload to the MFPs using Word documents, and uh, as well as uh, deliver payload uh, to the MFPs in a generic way using uh, Java and some other researchers demonstrated with, with JavaScript. So web is also an avenue for this, not only uh, open and print attachments. Uh, but this talk is not uh, not only about basically uh, hacking MFPs in the generic way, but it has like a PostScript uh, orientation. And what about PostScript? It's basically a general purpose language. Uh, invented by Adobe in '85, uh, and basically it was uh, one of the first uh, typesetting languages available on the market. Uh, and the picture 
is very representative because it's a picture from the Adobe's presentation of a PostScript, and it turns out that the road of PostScript is as long and it's bumpy and has unexpected turns at the end. So it was somehow prophetic. <clears throat> Again, PostScript, uh, if you have uh, listened to the previous talk, it's a Turing-complete language, and as you could understand from, I'm not very big expert in uh, formal languages and so on, but as you could understand, Turing complete languages are not very secure, so to speak. But uh, basically, uh, Adobe's uh, implementation of PostScript is, uh, uh, has the widest share on the market, and it's implemented in most uh, PostScript interpreters and printers and uh, on various workstations uh, doing the formatting. So it's about roughly 90%, uh, according to some supplemental note, it's uh, roughly 90% of Adobe's interpreters versus 10% of other vendors for PostScript interpreters. And the interesting side is basically PostScript being a general purpose language and being Turing complete uh, was built with very generic ideas in mind and it is built uh, with very powerful capabilities, and basically it has file system uh, or some kind of virtual file system operators and uh, input-output subsystems like Ethernet or serial port, whatever is available on the device. So, and it was demonstrated over time with various complex uh, design uh, problems or complex problems in general have been uh, uh, implemented in PostScript, like. Uh, seen guys implementing web servers, seen guys implementing ray tracing in OpenGL, uh, guys running post scripts for the milling machines, XML parsers or other languages parsers. So it's a very general purpose uh, language and very powerful. However, the specification of PostScript dates back, the latest revision as far as I remember is 99, so uh, there hasn't been too much uh, review uh, in a while, so it, I would say it didn't quite adapt to the current uh, security landscape. And one of the things which struck me uh, and us in, during our, uh, this research is that the PostScript uh, specification mentions something about the interpreter or a shell or something like this, execute, executive. So, if you go to the specification, you'll see clearly that they say you can enter some kind of a debug mode. So if you ever worked with GhostScript, which is a PostScript interpreter for PCs or whatever, uh, maybe you are very familiar with that console which says GS and uh, the greater sign. So basically, you can get the same on the printers, and basically you can, it, it is designed so uh, that you can debug your, why your PostScript document is not being properly uh, printed, displayed, or uh, why the printer just spits garbage. So you can enter, or a software engineer can enter uh, the interpreter and uh, see what is the problem, debug the document, and format it properly. But it can be also used to play with the interpreter or find other uh, hidden functions in the interpreter or the uh, printer or whatever. <clears throat> so, uh, as, as far as uh, we have seen various uh, estimation notes is that around 80% of uh, MFPs and printers have this uh, uh, interpreter or executive or shell enabled and 20 doesn't have it applicable or doesn't have it enabled. So, <clears throat> You would ask how to enter this shell. It's quite simple. If you are familiar with PostScript or PGL or PCL, it's a PGL job where you enter the PostScript language, self-explanatory. We have the standard PS Adobe uh, PostScript header, some comments, and then we just write this <coughs> executive command and we enter an interactive shell uh, of the PostScript interpreter. Uh, so, we'll have a demo. So, we'll just ping our uh, target MFP. 
And then we'll just connect it. Uh, again, whoever answered Xerox, the vendor we talk about in this talk is Xerox. So uh, those 5% were very close, despite their uh, quite secure products. <coughs> so, but this, uh, this code works on HPs, on most HP models and Canons and so on. So we have our PostScript language, we have it, uh, give it a title and just send this uh, document as a uh, job printing spool on the port 9100. And as you can see, it popped up uh, the interpreter uh, software version uh, and revision and uh, copyright notes and other stuff. So you can basically uh, start uh, running any PostScript code which you had in mind and run this code on the printers itself. So you can uh, do print or you can do some general purpose uh, computation, matrix computation, and so on and so on because it's a very powerful language. <coughs> uh, so I've used few operators like product and version and pstack which prints the stack and so on and so on. So basically you can go to your closest MFP or printer try this uh, and you get this kind of shell. So you can start fuzzing the interpreter, maybe there's a bug in interpreter, but the purpose of this talk is not exploiting the bug in specific interpreter. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, what did we find uh, using <coughs> this approach? So, we've been, we needed like a PostScript based firmware upload or a PostScript-based mechanism to execute code or non-graphics uh, uh, code on the MFPs and printers. And we've been looking, looking, looking through the firmware, and it was like tons of downloads until we find a very nice user guide we, where the vendor tells you, um, go to the print page. Here's your .ps uh, firmware upgrade, which already raises questions, how a uh, .postscript file should upgrade your uh, firmware. And then in the user guide, uh, we are kind of stuck and see that they say go, upload it, and hit the print button, because it's usually the file, uh, uh, printing page of the MFP where you can, normal users go and upload uh, a text file, a PDF file, just for printing. But using the same print page, Basically, you can upgrade the firmware. And this is the intended mechanism. So we said it's very interesting. Let's see what this PostScript uh, file contains. It's usually 40 or 50 megabytes long. And basically, what we found is like a big set of APIs, right? And basically, most of these MFPs are implemented in some kind of real-time operating system, like Vakesworks or uh, uh, Lynx OS or some, some kinds of this. This specific model line implements Vakesworks. <clears throat> so we found Vakesworks API, debug and QA API, like doing automation tests or performance tests. We found some logging APIs, some pump uh, setup API because it has some pumps for the ink and for other things. We had the uh, RAM disk, RAM, flash, and billing meters API. <clears throat> Billing meters is also a very interesting part because you know the counterfeit industry tries to circumvent the metering and uh, uh, original components. <clears throat> so it was like very, very good to be true in the sense that we got so many API very well linked to the hardware level, but exposed to the PostScript, <clears throat> uh, to the PostScript language. And writing PostScript is not very easy, but, or not very sweet, so to speak, un unless you adapt your mindset, but it was very, very interesting finding. So from the, we, we just took one part of the API, and we found uh, that it had some memory access, uh, physical operating system memory access functionality. So you can say from PostScript, say, uh, VxOrgs give me uh, bytes from this physical address, and it will give you. So we wrote a memory dumper, which dumps basically the memory. <coughs> uh, 
And it is an old technique because, as you might know, once you have the memory dump, you have basically all computation secrets on any computation platform, so to speak, because a uh, file system might not be involved, but everything which is in uh, RAM or uh, in the memory is basically a live state of a computing machine. <coughs> so we said, OK, it's very, very nice to have this memory dumping technique. <coughs> and then we just sit and wrote a couple of demos. And basically, <coughs> I'll be showing you the demos. So let's say we, we have this uh, printer, and it has the administrative security settings where you can say enable the admin password and uh, other power, power user settings like key user and key password, and we set them. <coughs> and we disable any user from doing anything normally thought as administrative level operations. We save, and basically we get an acknowledgment that <coughs> security settings were set on the device. So from this perspective, administrator or whoever is doing a security check says, OK, the printer is like admin locked. It should work fine, and nobody except admin, knowing the password, should be able to do something malicious, right? Because usually the admin interface is something that malicious users abuse. But we go from the back side. We go from the postscript, from the normal document flow, document uh, printing language. <coughs> and what we do, basically, we just take our uh, code, we run it. There was a postscript code, which we didn't want at this particular moment to show. And we got a, me a memory dump of whatever is there. So the first uh, thing we notice is that setting an admin password on the web interface doesn't necessarily fix the other modules like PostScript or other modules involved. So we see some different. <laughs> it's too hot from in the room, right? It should be <laughs> too hot now. Because it doesn't prevent the attack being run on the printer. Uh, so it's, it's one of the flaws, because it doesn't restrict uh, special operations. <clears throat> so this is just a diagram of the attack, but having a postscript with a bomb inside uh, circumvents the administrative settings and doesn't uh, prevent the memory dumping. Uh, so then, the next uh, thing is we think that, OK, we have secured our uh, product, and we uh, have a password on it, one administrative interface, and let's say we change it regularly, right? We follow our policies, we change it every 30 days or so, we put strong passwords, strong usernames, <coughs> right? Uh, and just for information, the password and usernames were the same, like admin 28c3. So, and we log on from time to time just to check that the uh, printer or MFP is fine, <laughs> right? <coughs> and we see we've logged in. And now the idea is that. As you can see, that pop-up is usually like a basic authorization, authentication authorization over HTTP. And we just let compute its base64, whatever is being sent over HTTP, actually, right? <coughs> Admin username and password. But the attacker can send a very specific print job, which dumps a lot of memory and does some searching, and so on and so on. Uh, and what we demonstrate in this demo is that we dump a specific region of the memory we know, and we take all the memory and using not very smart techniques. And uh, <laughs> I mean, an attacker can can get like access to the password and username right from the memory, 
as you can see, whatever you, last username or last several usernames and passwords have been logging in to this admin interface, we have them all, right, in the memory dump. So again, having this and using them often uh, basically gives more chances to the attacker to get your passwords, right? So again, uh, do not abuse <laughs> your admin interfaces to check them often. And we can see other details like uh, whatever uh, browser the admin used, and we can see if the admin uh, can be exploited, and so on and so on. You can think any other scenario. So basically, the diagram is simple. Authorization, OK. We get the postscript in memory. It gets the password to the attacker. OK, so basically, somebody would, would, would think, OK, let's enable HTTPS, right? We'll get everything encrypted. However, we have found, using the same memory dumping technique, that even security protocols are being leaky in the sense that we have found various private keys, like in memory, or IPsec authentication keys, which, again, basically, it's, we, we don't have a demo which we decrypt the traffic because uh, we didn't have to. We had other simpler means to hack it, right? But again, it's a warning, a big warning. Once the attacker has the secrets from the memory, circumventing file access or any other means is like useless. Okay, and basically, let's. We, we demonstrated that securing the web interface doesn't solve your problem basically in all the cases, right? So what about somebody printing, let's say, a very confidential and secure document, and so on and so on? We simulate that, and we have found, as you see in the demo, we have a remote desktop. Let's say it's a high rank official. And basically, the high rank official wants to, to print a very secret document, OK? High rank official has access to the, to the printer. And we'll simulate as he was printing from his preferred uh, document management application. But it's the same thing. Basically, everything goes on that port. And as, let's say, the high rank official sets a pin for, for the print job so nobody can print uh, or take the printout from the machine until the correct pin is entered, or some machines allow you uh, passwords, right? And the content of this document is supposed to be, like, secured. And even for you think that putting some uh, security devices on both ends, both ends so that everything is encrypted on the wire and no wire shark can sniff it, we are running in the memory. So guess what? At some point, this encryption of, on the wire gets decrypted in the memory. So basically, whatever is being printed here, his username and PIN and so on, we'll just send it to the, to the printer. And in a couple of seconds, we'll see what actually happens. OK, so the remote desktop, we simulate the printout. The job is, is, went to the printer, to the MFP. And I got a paper out of a, a tested device. OK? Blank, because it wasn't too much of a, a thing to draw, like uh, just a move to. On the other end, the attacker uh, connects to the same MFP. OK? having the IP 101, and just running the spe specific memory dumping code and uh, on the specific region we have tried to map. OK, just one sec. And again, you see a lot of memory dumping. We Knowing the memory area gives us a lot of advantage because we can just go and check the, the details or write a simple matching function, and that's it. And let's say we have in the memory, as you can see, basically 
in the memory, everything which the high rank official, so to speak, or victim has printed and thought to be secure, basically it's being uh, clear text in the memory. And as you can see, the attacker also knows the IP from which uh, the secret document was printed, right? And he knows the contents, knows the pin code. He can basically harvest pin code uh, uh, pin codes and passwords from uh, this user and get more advanced knowledge. Okay? See? So basically everything is in clear text in memory, even though you might think it goes even encrypted on the wire. Yeah, so basically we have access to the interpreter memory and uh, document processing. Okay? So just, it's simple, password, lock, and encryption goes to the printer, postscript, inside the memory, the printed document goes to the attacker. So it's a very dangerous avenue because basically you understand that data theft is pretty easy. Okay, and at the end you might be asking, for example, okay, an attacker can have the access to the memory, but what what more he can do to take the data out because uh, what I've been showing is just running some code in the backend and with uh, access to specific APIs, basically we have found uh, full BSD style sockets. So you can understand that a specific full end-to-end -end program can take the memory dump encrypt it for the attacker or uh, just strip the necessary details and then send with full, full BSD sockets to the attacker and then also use the MFP as internal network <coughs> uh, scanning or attacking device. So basically, we just show that we, we ping the device, okay? And the direction in this was from our uh, uh, attacker computer to the printer. And now we tell that to the printer, we run the specific postscript code. Okay, we see that attacker, okay, these ports are open because we simulate that we print something to the MFP. And basically we take the code, run it on the on the MFP, and as you can see, now the ping request is from IP 102. The ping request comes from 102. 102 being the MFP. So basically, we have a full BSD style socket uh, control in the MFP, and it's like a game over, right? You can initiate any kind of uh, raw packet, raw socket, whatever your techniques, uh, techniques you know, right? Yeah, so it, it seems pretty, pretty scary if you glue all this code together and run a very simple, small file document. <coughs> yeah, <laughs> this is a simple diagram. So we try to, to summarize, and basically on the attacks we have been trying on this machine, or on this kind line of the devices, is uh, the protection measures we try to fault where uh, have been easily defeated by the demonstration we have shown. Basically, we have a privilege level separation failure where I, I, sh I showed the administration level not being enough to restrict the memory dumping and other API calls, and so on and so on. So secure password setup, also password is being sent in clear text and in, uh, intercepted in the memory. Okay, so <clears throat> now from our, <clears throat> our uh, research, we have found that basically all of these devices and device line is uh, using the same uh, postscript uh, firmware update mechanism, meaning that uh, all of them share more or less a common base of exposed APIs 
an API which can be used in the same manner as demonstrated in the previous demos. Uh, so more or less a generic PostScript uh, malicious program can be written which perfectly or more or less perfectly exploits all of these devices. Uh, some of them are have the same uh, device number, but they, they're different in various uh, configuration, hardware configuration, or uh, vague source version, or platforms, but because we have PostScript, which is like a Java for printers, uh, it, it is like platform independent. Okay, so just to summarize, <coughs> the attack in the nutshell, in few, in, in a single slide would be like this, like from our 2010 demonstrations, the attacker sends if a, a MS Word uh, document specially crafted, which has a, a malicious postscript inside it, or he can send specific URLs to the victim on the email or a messenger when, where the victim clicks and goes to specific sites, Okay, in the case of the Word document, the user opens the attachment, sees nothing uh, suspicious because there is no computer virus in it. It is a virus in PostScript for MFPs for which we are not aware of any antivirus or IDS or IPS uh, existing on the market. And in the other two cases, it's just a web page requesting you to print something. Think of Coupons, right? Who doesn't love coupons? It's like freebies. And the user just print the attachment or print from the web. The malicious payload hidden in the MS Word or Java applet or uh, JavaScript just goes to the, to the MFP and plants the PostScript. And the PostScript, as you can see, uh, could see in the previous videos, can do any kind of malicious attacks on, on the network itself, and also do data theft, document theft, and so on and so on. So basically, enterprise assets are at risk in this particular scenario. <coughs> so what, what we envision next is to put everything together and basically make a kind of PostScript toolkit having various uh, generic PostScript or Xerox-specific PostScript, which ties together the sockets and file system and other uh, exposed APIs, uh, port at least some, some Metasploit samples, and just have uh, an attacking demo toolkit for high-level high, high language like PostScript, which uh, can be easily abused and can be a very powerful target for even for other vendors because we didn't test all the vendors and all their other devices. So this kind of scenario would be very dangerous because, for example, PostScript is a, <coughs> is a Turing complete and you can basically uh, write some uh, bytes on the stack, then concatenate them and then apply CVX operator and everything like string becomes executable and it executes and all kind of mess. So it's very hard to actually detect a malicious byte stream because like you can compose executed programs from any combination of encoding, decoding filters and various hex byte manipulation uh, techniques. So whatever you know, uh, techniques known in, post in JavaScript and PDF combined and so on, were like easily transposed to PostScript. And <coughs> as a solutions, basically we have various categories or actors which we try to give some advice. Uh, for example, for administrators, how, is, how easy is to defend against these attacks? You'll see in the following video, videos, but because of the uh, Explicit, explicit documentation and explanatory notes missing. It's not very un easy to understand what those settings do, so admins just prefer not to touch those settings if everything works. So to, to defend against this attack is quite simple in the first perspective. 
So a user can go. If you own a Xerox listed there, I would suggest going uh, right after this talk. And OK, you can leave everything in or whatever settings you have. And there is a thing called language operator authorization. I'm not sure how much does it tell you as an administrator of a device when you have like uh, heterogeneous networks with hundreds of device language operator authorization. So the idea is that you have to uncheck that box so that this kind of attacks will not be possible. However, uh, the idea is simple that the language operator authorization is usually enabled by default. So most probably at the next unsecure uh, patch, it will be enabled by default. And the idea is if you disable it, you cannot actually upgrade the firmware. So to upgrade the firmware of the printer, you have to enable it. And once you enable it, most probably you'll leave it like this or forget about it. Otherwise, you run into other kinds of problems. And this is a drawback. This should be if the mechanism should be a little bit different or the documentation should be very, very easy to understand what this checkbox done, does. So basically, just unchecking this box uh, will help you to prevent in the short run uh, and mitigate these kinds of attacks. So as you can see, basically, we have this disabled. And you can see we have like invalid access uh, given by the device. So in short term, it's, it's a solution for you as administrator. You have Xerox of these models. Go and do this now. Don't forget to enable when you do firmware upgrades. <coughs> OK. We uh, should look for security bulletins for various vendors, depending how heterogeneous your MFP environment is. It's like keep an eye on HP, on Xerox, on Canon, on every vendor, if you have all these vendors in your network. Because PostScript interpreters have their own bugs as well, or various customization which has bugs. So it's very, very good to see. Uh, sandbox the, the printer, so they are if uh, have their own VLAN or uh, have very limited and restricted environment, and so on. And very important, include MFPs in the security audit lifecycle. So most of the uh, because they are not very homogeneous or doesn't have like a very usual uh, security uh, uh, settings, they are often left outside of the security audit lifecycle because it's just a printer, it prints on the paper, but it's, as you could see, it's not the case. For the users, it's hard. Uh, you just can advise, but you cannot guard them or beat their fingers. So just have to educate, uh, the managers have to educate the users or users educate themselves. Do not print from untrusted sources or be suspicious what you print, especially it's freebie. OK, and for the vendors, uh, to before or during their life cycle to create realistic MFP threat models, meaning that try to put that MFP in a real world scenario, a, a real world uh, security uh, landscape, because uh, putting it out of a context and uh, checking it for security, right, admin interface is secured, everything is fine, we are great. But if you put it in another context, then it completely changes the game. So realistic MFP threat models is one of the things which, that can be improved. And uh, other thing, as history has shown over and over again, is that just do not enable or expose or do not use and implement super APIs and try then to hide them. Just don't do this. It's the wrong way of doing, I, I think. OK, so we'd like to thank uh, Xerox security team because they were uh, positively on responding to our uh, responsible disclosure uh, contact. And we were very active working with them. Uh, and their side is well, very active in checking the affected user base and propose uh, active mitigations. Uh, and basically, what are the takeaways from this talk is uh, MFPs are really, really bad 
insecurity as, as we stand right now on here in this room. So this has to be understood because in the last couple of years, a lot of MFP and printer security talks evolved and techniques. And we basically want to emphasize that there might be uh, upcoming wave of various uh, security threats targeting MFPs because of their weaknesses. Of course, criminals or others could go for the easy, easy prey. And why not doing this? And basically, the, other, the last thing is securing the MFP infrastructure requires better segmentation, strong credential, secure, uh, secure proactive thinking, and basically continuous vulnerability patching in its all life cycle, meaning from vendor to the client, to the admins, to the user, and so on. So it's just, not just a target to achieve a security compliance level, but again, it's a whole process in itself. So basically, these are my contact details. If you have any detailed question afterwards, for this moment, I say thank you. And if you have any questions in the room. Please try to remain seated while the question and answer is ongoing because it's extremely distracting if people are going to leave now en masse. So if you have questions, queue up at the microphones. I am seeing two already. This one was first. Very interesting talk, thanks. I have one question about something you alluded to in your slides. Um, given a Word document, how can I embed a PostScript fragment in it that will execute on the printer? Have you explored that at all? Is that an avenue that's actually available to attackers? Basically, this attack, which you are asking about, or document, it's been demonstrated in my 2010 and 2011 talks. And in the slides, you'll get a link to the YouTube showing this attack. So it's not theoretical, it's actually practical. I mean, you can, there, there are really ways, and I'm trying to also, we are trying to, to go with vendors of office or whatever, right? To see how it can be solved, but it's like a legacy functionality which we've been carried. So it's available, I think, from Word 3.1 or whatever till now. So it's a practical attack. So the last one, my memory is that you can embed an EPS into a Word document and that gets sent to the printer uh, raw. Um, question, how certain are you that the super APIs are only available in executive mode? Uh, come again, please. Are the APIs also available outside the executive? And can you prove they're not? Uh, ba basically, <clears throat> we, we don't care if they're, at, at this particular moment, we didn't care uh, secret or hidden or super APIs being outside of the executive because uh, once we had them in the executive, it gives us uh, platform independence and basically it was the thing we found and we explored it. So, but it doesn't exclude the possibility of uh, having other hidden APIs. And just to give you an example, uh, I have seen basically firmware updates where PCL and PCL being a very, very restricted language compared to PostScript, which is just drawing, right? But even there, I found vendors which have secret APIs and do firmware updates through PCL, which doesn't, doesn't come even close to PostScript in powerful general purpose or uh, other levels, right? So of course, there are plenty of them, but because they're embedded system, closed things, very heavy, uh, to, to try to purchase and explore by independent researchers, it's still hidden. Okay, we are leaving no note behind, so we have a question from the internet. Yeah, here somebody wants to know if it is uh, possible to change the uh, printer firmware so that the printer can damage itself, leading up to uh, completely destroy itself. Uh, I, I missed the second part. The question was whether it's possible for the printer to destroy itself by changing the firmware. Well, uh, basically, I 
would not like to comment on this because there was like a big hype fuzz and so on and so on. Uh, unless, I, I'll put it this way, unless there is, uh, okay, just, just a complete thought. Printer fusers, especially laser ones, have specific temperature ranges, right? Some of them go to 250, some of them go to 270. Normal uh, paper burning temperature depends whether it's surface or there's an ignition source or not, and so on and so on. And putting these things together is hard to say that plain paper, paper would just start burning in the printer. <laughs> right? But, um. but, but, what I want to say is, um, for example, imagine if there's a more complex attack where the paper supplier is being actively attacked by whoever and puts sheet of paper, sheets of paper with special powder or uh, chemical substance uh, whose auto ignition temperature is like 230. And there are like three or four substances which can do this. So in a combined attack, yes, this is pretty accomplishable even today, right? But these are just facts, and unless there is a demo demonstrating this, or unless there is an independent laboratory, safety laboratory, which demonstrates otherwise, it's really hard to tell that, yes, this is true. This, yes, it's, it's like a P different than P, right? Okay, but I think this is a very stupid thing because if I want to burn the, P, uh, the printer, I can just put gasoline in there and, and flame it. And so I don't need to know something about Postscript. But, um, but I think it's a, that's another interesting thing. It would be interesting to buy exactly the same printer, have fun with the logic analyzer, and modify the firmware. So I have my own printer, modify a firmware, put in some special function that I want to have, and then make a document with this modified firmware, send it to somebody I want to tease, and he gets my special firmware, and I can, can do some special stuff with his, with his printer. And I think this would be more interesting. And there's also uh, one interesting point, because modern photocopiers and bigger printers have hard disks, and these hard disks store all the jobs. And so if you, for example, go cleaning, you can exchange the hard disks every, every day, so if you maybe uh, you 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 say I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a un, un, uh, I'm, I'm a low skilled worker and I go cleaning and then you for example go for the hardest and this would be interesting for example to it, to know if they are encrypted or not and then if they are encrypted to get the keys from the memory and then uh, have fun with the hardest contents. Uh, the points are good. I just want to 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 put some one point for for each of your part. Bas basically. Indeed, having a custom firmware is interesting, uh, and indeed putting like a, a backdoor functionality there is even more exciting. Uh, however, I, I'll just try to, to emphasize, which I wanted actually during the talk, is that uh, demonstrations which I've showed you relies basically on simple PostScript commands, and I don't even have to know anything about the uh, firmware format, firmware signatures, firmware packing, and so on and so on. I just run PostScript. And this is a very important point because compared, for example, for other attacks, in order to write yourself a custom firmware, it's not necessarily very easy because there are, as I said, a lot of steps involved, like uh, understanding the pa packaging format, understanding the signature, uh, writing the firmware of completely uh, heterogeneous and non-very used uh, hardware is indeed a challenge. And for uh, it depends what your, your scope. If you want to bug, for example, a specific country where you ship a specific model line, of course, there's like all the possibility in this. But if you target only a specific user, there are easier ways to go around. And uh, the second point, uh, what you said about uh, hard disk, actually it is well-known problem and in 2010 there was a big uh, investigation done by CBS in the United States where recycled MFPs, printers, copiers got sold and they belonged to government agencies 
and there were unencrypted documents regarding criminals and prosecutions and orders and so on. And then it was raised at very high level, and basically the vendors had to come with military standards for uh, digital information shredding on the hard disk. However, we don't have any independent uh, uh, view and testing results over the efficiency and effectiveness of those um, shredding techniques implemented by the vendors. They are claiming, they are being certified, but there is no like, independent view on whether these are effective. Of course, you can do a lot of work, and actually this was done by a CBS uh, investigative journalist, and it was proven, so. Uh, are the uh, firmware images somehow signed so that the printer says, no, this is an illegal image, I don't want to print it, and I will go into some debug me service number so-and-so mode, and then you have to call the service. So if you, for example, want to, to, to print a money bill, they go also into a special service mode that you cannot print again. And so maybe they, if, if, you, if you want to, so if I would make a printer, I would make it like this, that if you put an illegal image that it goes into a special mode and locks it up. Well, it's again, you know, it's a, it's a philosophical problem. What if the same was done for your iPhone, for example? You could never uh, use it again if you put some other firmware or signature, was, signature checking was indeed enforced, checked, and so on. Would you be happy to have your device locked? It's a, again, there is no true, true, true balance in here, and you cannot lock a user device. However, the, the takeaway from your question is to have a secure uh, hashing algorithm, not CRC32, and enforce it and check it properly. These are the takeaways. Now, whatever other things are going wrong in that direction is a totally different story, I think. But you haven't investigated if this is enforced by the Xerox printers. No, no, okay. no. Okay, we'll do this round robin. There was a question over there, unless it's died of old age, okay. Then we have two questions in the front. One from the internet first, I think. Well, there is one. Um, has Xerox uh, did anything against this um, attacks? Sir? Did Xerox do anything against the attacks? B basically, we are in the process of uh, responsible disclosure and uh, mitigation techniques and uh, affected user base discussion. So, as you understand, it's like a longer patching process, like uh, assessing the risk and so on and so on. So, we are in the process, but it's not yet ended, so to speak. Okay, uh, a one time only offer. I bring the microphone to you. Uh, okay, you have four memory dumps. Can you use them to have a software printer emulator so it, you can do all the security? destruction on the software printer instead of destroying your physical printer, which is fairly expensive? <laughs> well, I, I, I don't know how, how much would destroying a virtual printer would help you in assessing the, the threat and risk of destroying the physical printer. So, but your first part, first point which you mentioned actually is very valid in the sense that because PostScript is a Turing-complete language and it has very interesting primitives, you can actually redefine the language. And basically, whatever the user uh, document contains, like draw this line, put this dash, use this character, you can route everything through your own APIs. So basically, you can write a virtual PostScript interpreter in PostScript and route any uh, any of the basic PostScript calls to you and store all the data in the file system for later retrieval. So basically you do a virtual machine in a virtual machine, so to speak, using simple PostScript. It's, it's a tedious process to write like a PostScript custom virtual machine on top and uh, redefine all the operators and language and so on, but it's doable. It's, there, are, there are samples on the internet and it's easy to do. OK, uh, we have five minutes left. The remaining questions over there. So you've looked at a lot of these specialized operators in PostScript. And I'm wondering if you've seen any bugs that look like they could lead to native code execution on the uh, microprocessor that's implementing the PostScript interpreter. 
So just to, to understand uh, if there are any bugs which we can exploit from PostScript to execute code on the microprocessor. Obviously, the firmware update is one way to get native code execution, but I'm wondering if there's any runtime exploits. <laughs> yeah, ba basically, in this particular scenario, you don't need even an exploit. And I'll tell you why. There, there are two things. Actually, you can patch the code in the memory. You can also have write access. And if you know which memory to which device is being mapped and uh, know that uh, operator uh, opcode language, you can patch it in the memory. This is one. This is an obvious exploit. But the second is everything is running in VXWorks, a specific version where you can run it through QEMU or so on and so on. And there, uh, file system APIs where uh, <clears throat> we can actually uh, write uh, a binary blob to, to the physical uh, operating system file system. Okay? So you compile an executable for this VXWorks version. You just upload it. Uh, using PostScript, and basically it executes as part of VXWorks. We, we didn't go as far, but everything is in place. So with little effort of compiling and uploading is like, you get the point. OK, next question. Um, yeah, hi. i just like to add some notes on this hard disk issue or question. So I did some research on that with a colleague. And um, this. Can you speak louder? Um, I'm just commenting on this hard disk issue, which was just asked before. Um, I did some research on that with a, f with a colleague, and this whole thing with uh, secure file management and stuff turned out to be a total mess. So um, even though the vendors claim to use some secure file management, um, we were easily able to reconstruct uh, a lot of files. So um, what they do is they uh, create some kind of a pseudo file system which is not easily recognizable and looks like something encrypted. However, uh, if we have been working on the raw device, we were easily able to reconstruct file headers and uh, corresponding files. And uh, for several cases, we reconstructed like 10,000 files, which turned out to be basically everything which has been printed or scanned with this device in the last two years. So uh, yeah, you would not want to rely on that. So. Exactly. As, as it's mentioned. basically security by obscurity, and I mean, as we yeah, all know, it, this doesn't work at all. Right? It has to be independently tested and have a very open guideline for testing and assessing the security of these features, actually. Yeah, sure. Thanks. OK, then our time is up. Uh, when you're leaving, please exit. Thank you again. Yeah. Big applause. <laughs>